all the DreamWorks movies exist in the same universe and I can prove it. Kind of. Oh, do you see that light? I've got a second camera. Introduction to the DreamWorks theory. Is it like a chapter point? Like yeah, I read a bullet point. Let's pull the sleeves up. So ever since the release of John Negroni's article titled The Pixar Theory in 2012, a theory connecting all of the Pixar movies in the same universe, many people have tried to do the same thing with DreamWorks' movies. And I don't want to discredit anyone who's attempted to make this DreamWorks universe theory in the last 10 years, but nothing has really stuck or like made a cultural impact in the same kind of way. So you could be excused for being a big DreamWorks movies fan and have no idea what this DreamWorks universe timeline looks like. And that's why I'm here. I've gone through every article, every video, every forum post attempting to do so while researching this video. And here is a general run through of what this timeline looks like with no evidence. Just a quick recap. Oh yeah, I've split this up into phases like it's the MCU or something. We've got phase one, the Stone Ages. What do you think happens in the Stone the Ages? The Croods! Yeah, that's, that's all that happens in the Stone Ages. So the Stone Ages in the real world is a time period spanning from like millions of years ago to only a few thousand years ago. Meaning this movie happens somewhere in that really long time period, you know, just anywhere in these two million years. I feel like it must happen on the latter side of the cave people's existence because I feel like cave people are on the cusp of becoming intelligent in this era, but we can't really prove it and nor does it really matter. It's just the fact that this happened at some point in there and nothing else happened in there. Then we reach phase two. What was the phase two of the MCU? The D, the, the DC, this is also called the DCU. Why is everything I make a cinematic universe about beginning with D? The DreamWorks Cinematic Universe, but not to be confused with the Disney Cinematic Universe. Phase two is uh, the bronze slash iron ages, because I don't really know the difference between the two. So there's a bit of a time jump now from when the Croods happened to about the 10th, 15th century BC. So, you know, like 3,000 to 3,500 years ago from right now. Admittedly, most of the movies in this era are stories from the Bible that revolve around God in some way, and I'm probably going to go to hell for trying to connect them in a DreamWorks cinematic universe. <laughs> but what is established in those movies is that humans are advancing in terms of intelligence quite significantly, and you know, it's just pretty much exactly what happens on Earth. I'm not going to lie. We're just like, we were cave people for a few million years, and now we kind of have iron and bronze and have got some invention stuff. Oh, and also magic is present now. Um, I, I, that, that's more important. I should have mentioned that, that magic is important. Then we have phase three, the medieval era. Next up, we have the movies that probably take place around like the 10th to the 15th century AD. Again, not entirely clear where they are, but you know, they're somewhere in that time period. We get a few glimpses into some of the different parts of the world, like Europe, where Vikings are learning how to train dragons, and also a glimpse of pre-colonial, and also a glimpse of pre-colonial coke, and also a glimpse of pre-colonized North America, which is also fairy tale land, in this world because all the fairy tales just are real there. And naturally, again, in line with what really happened in the real world, it would mean we're just on the cusp of the age of exploration, perfectly leading to phase four colonization. So following seeing the rise of human beings and their coexistence with mythical beings, we jump forward to a time where humans are just so desperate for power of any kind that they're going to take whatever they can and stomp out anyone that gets in their way, which includes all mythical creatures and basically magic of any kind. And while there is still clearly remnants of magic in areas, particularly America, once the Europeans start to invade, let's just say it's not looking good. And we also really get to see the first examples of suppression of animals in universe, even when they're intelligent. They get completely treated like they're lesser beings. Bringing us to phase five, the present day, or I guess to do 5A, I'm gonna split this into three sections because they all kind of happen in the present day, but there's three different things going on. And this is the eradication of magic era of the present day era. And the main theme of these movies is that essentially magic has been eradicated from living memory. It's not gone. It's just been forgotten about. I want to bring up that the main bulk of Rise of the Guardians takes place here, which is probably one of the most important movies to like the lore of this theory and universe. But it's also kind of ongoing and ever present throughout all of the movies. It's just the main bulk of the movie takes place here. Meanwhile, the animals have just been completely suppressed while humans are kind of just living peacefully and getting on with their lives, which perfectly leads to phase 5B, alien invasion. So yeah, this is kind of out the blue, but during these peace times on Earth for humans, they just randomly get selected to get invaded by aliens, like three times in the very short space of time. We've got Monsters vs. Aliens, Megamind, and Home all just happening during all this in here. 
And then we have phase 5C, the rise of intelligent animals. Now this is pretty much where the main bulk of the movies are, and the general theme is that animals are intelligent, but humans have suppressed them for centuries. Animals are finally ready to rise up. In most cases though, on a pretty small scale. But like still, they're rising up, they're, they're fighting back. This is like genuinely the plot of about 50% of DreamWorks' movies, I'm not even joking. Whether that's through their inventions, or sporting achievements, or building entire underground societies. If there is one guarantee in a DreamWorks movie, it's that if there's an animal that is succeeding, there's gonna be some crazy French person that wants to take that animal down. Which brings us to phase six. The animal rights movement. Um, no. No. So towards the end of the last era, we were starting to see more acceptance towards animal rights and them becoming equals in society. But the pivotal movie that changes everything, welcoming in an era of its own, is the, the Bee Movie. Or just Bee Movie. It's, it, I actually found out it's not called The Bee Movie, it's just called Bee Movie. That is actually really, that's more frustrating than the plot. You see, it's here in the B movie that animals finally actually come out of hiding and, well, specifically Barry B. Benson communicates with humans and then takes them to court to fight for animal rights. B movie ends with bees getting given equal rights to humans and that is the first major step in the animal rights movement. And this theme of taking humans to court and winning rights for animals is then continued in Mr. Peabody and Sherman, where a dog wins the rights to adopt and raise a human boy, and then concluding with the bad guys, where animals are just starting to live in society simultaneously with humans. And obviously the animal characters in this movie are like definitely the outcasts, that's kind of the entire point of the movie. It's the first time we actually see humans and animals living somewhat as equals in this series. But it doesn't last for long, which brings us to phase seven, human extinction. So it's unclear how long humans and animals lived in harmony together, but it's also fundamentally clear due to one of DreamWorks' most successful franchises, Kung Fu Panda, that at some point, animals are living in the human society without humans. Leading me to draw the only obvious conclusion that at some point between the bad guys and Kung Fu Panda, humans and animals went to war and animals won killing off all the humans. Meaning, by the time of Kung Fu Panda, the entire human race has supposedly been killed off, probably justifiably due to the humans' actions in almost every other movie outside of that. And now, they're living in harmony without us. And that, why did I move my mic away from my face? And that is the DreamWorks universe theory. But that is just the setup, the, the premise. This is no normal video. Today, I'm going to prove that these exist in the same universe from a canon perspective. So I guess that means I have to explain the rules for those of you who haven't watched one of my videos where I do this before. Basically, over the last few months, I've gone through every DreamWorks Easter egg cameo and reference throughout their entire catalog of movies. And throughout this video, I'm going to take a movie and use these Easter eggs, cameos and references as evidence to prove that that movie exists in the same universe as another movie in the DreamWorks cinematic universe. However, it's not just as simple as this movie has an Easter egg connecting it to that movie, they also have to pass this thing we've coined the logic test. I don't know why I said we, I coined it the logic test. You guys had no part in that. Which basically, if you can cast your minds back to about two minutes ago when I took you through that DreamWorks universe timeline, every movie has a place where it logically makes sense it would be on that timeline. So if something doesn't seem to quite make sense or maybe feels a little out of place for where it should be in the timeline, we're gonna need a good explanation to explain why it is where it is. Which I guess brings us to the introduction of our independent mediator, Vegard. Everyone give a round of applause for Vegard, Vegard. I'll make it seem like you came in quickly I, in the edit. I yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> if Vegard agrees that two movies connect, then he will connect them with a bit of red yarn. If he doesn't agree they connect, the movie goes into the defamed corner of death. <laughs> but hopefully that isn't going to happen this time and all the movies will be connected by the end of the video. Is that a threat? And with that, finally, let's just narrow down what we're working with. So the rules to exist in this universe are not as complicated as existing in like a Disney cinematic universe. You essentially just have to be a production made by DreamWorks Animation which basically means all of the movies that are on this Wikipedia page I'm showing right now on screen. That, that's the whole criteria. If you're on this list, you can exist in the universe. If you're not, 
you, you can't. I'm not here today to try and create some expanded universe and connect Winnie the Pooh to the DreamWorks cinematic universe because Winnie the Pooh shows up in the B-movie or anything like that. You have to be by DreamWorks and DreamWorks animation specifically. And obviously with DreamWorks, there are a lot more franchises than just standalone movies. Like, most of their movies feel like they have a sequel to them. There are even more TV shows. I was genuinely shocked by the amount of TV shows there are made based on DreamWorks movies. And while the focus for this video is obviously the movies, the general rule of thumb with TV shows is that if they are based around some pre-existing characters from a movie, they are obviously canon to the lore of that movie, so therefore are going to be canon to this universe. But if it's just a TV show made by DreamWorks Television Animation that isn't connected to any pre-existing movie like She-Ra or Voltron or VeggieTales, we're not gonna attempt to even try and connect that. And also, I feel like this goes without saying, but I'm only gonna be dealing with the stuff that happens in these movies and TV shows. I feel like the video games can connect too much stuff and make it too easy, so we're ignoring that. We're gonna be ignoring stuff that happens in musicals and theme parks, just the movies and TV shows. The first movie we have is The Croods. It's it's really like you are a ring girl. You're like just like... I know. <laughs> As we covered earlier, The Croods takes place some way before every other movie in the universe. Humans are shown to be on the verge of intelligence with inventions and art, but for the most part in these movies, animals and humans are living in harmony, and we definitely haven't reached the point of animal oppression yet. And you might be wondering, with a movie so far in the past, how on earth are we going to connect it to one of the other movies? Because like, if any character shows up there, it's just not gonna make sense. Are you thinking that? I was just thinking exactly that. <laughs> and you'd be right. There are no Easter eggs in The Croods, or The Croods A New Age. But, once we delve into the TV show Dawn of the Croods, we get our first crossover. As Mr. Peabody and Sherman make a cameo in the Dawn of the Croods episode, It Crushes, where they're seen as a cave painting in the Cave of Secrets. That happens before. That's probably what you're correctly thinking. How on earth does that work? Time travel. Have you seen Mr. Peabody and Sherman? No. In the timeline, chronologically, Mr. Peabody and Sherman is definitely one of the last movies as Mr. Peabody is shown to be one of the most intelligent, if not the most intelligent animal in the entire universe and literally wins the right to adopt a human boy. But the entire premise of his character is that he builds a time machine called The Wayback and spends Sherman's entire childhood bringing him back to the past and showing him historical events as they happened, like, in real life. They don't care about messing up with the timeline and just the space-time continuum altogether. And it's just a weird time travel movie that m nothing makes sense in. Which really helps this video. That's literally my line. And I'm going to use it as much as I possibly can to help clear up complications that might be presented with the timeline issues in these movies. Because time travel is real. And I just wanted to get that right out the way. So yeah, to start, they are present in the Stone Ages, which they obviously must have gone back to visit, and therefore some cave people must have seen them and then drawn them on the walls. Because, you know, I wouldn't even be surprised if Mr. Peabody and Sherman drew some stuff of their own on those walls, you know? I would think they would have to, considering they wouldn't have paint and uh, colors. So Mr. Peabody and Sherman maybe drew that out themselves. That's a really good point. Wow, I'm glad you agreed with that. I, I literally had Get Vegard to agree written there. So um, anyway, let's jump forward a good few thousand, maybe even million years to the days of Moses. Yeah, we're gonna, we're gonna bring Moses into the fold now. As you'll know, Moses is the titular character in the movie, The Prince of Egypt. Now in our world, the story of Moses is assumed to have happened about 3,500 years ago. So we're going to assume it takes place at the same point in this timeline. And at this point, we can clearly see that humans have advanced quite a lot, yet there's no real evidence of like hyper-intelligent animals, probably because that would be a bit weird if the Prince of Egypt just had talking animals in it. And in Mr. Peabody and Sherman, during a flashback scene where we're going through Sherman's childhood, we see Moses and his mother, Queen Tuya. And uh, this is actually just like almost a shot for shot remake of the actual scene from the Prince of Egypt. So are you are you happy with that? So it is just what, is one thing per thing. Vegard's agreed, I think. Um, he hasn't said, he didn't say he agreed, he's just doing it, so. Um... I agree. <laughs> so I think despite the fact the movie revolves around characters from the Bible, who are technically real historical figures in our world, DreamWorks' rendition of it is technically canon in universe. And if Moses is canon, does that mean Judaism is canon and therefore Jesus and Christianity are canon in universe? Sorry, moving on, because this movie actually has a prequel, kind of. So you may know, I've maybe mentioned it before, that Disney used to make like a lot of straight to DVD sequels back in like the 90s, early 2000s. And DreamWorks also made one 
Kind of. They made a movie called Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor Dreamcoat. I'm cracking jokes that I'm hoping the audience will find funny. So historically, the story of Joseph takes place a few hundred years before the story of Moses and is in the book of Genesis, which comes before the book of Exodus. And it's generally seen as a prequel to the Prince of Egypt, but I haven't counted them as one because they technically don't share any characters between them. However, Jacob, who is Joseph's father and of course an important character in the King of Dreams, is referenced in the Prince of Egypt by God. I am the God of your ancestors, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But I'm connecting them just through the fact that I see them as a prequel and a, like, a movie to, to each other. And if you connect them, I will not bring up the Bible again in this video. <laughs> it's kind of similar to Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, and Spirit Untamed. Their movies I'm assuming in the same universe, but aren't connected by any characters or anything, but I, I assume they're connected because they're part of the same movie series. Bible is canon. Okay, let's switch it up and talk about the boss baby. Going from Bible stories to <laughs> the boss baby feels like crazy. I think it's appropriate. Now, obviously the boss baby takes place during this present day era where the animals are growing in intelligence and about to start fighting for their rights. And your eyes might deceive you into thinking this isn't one of the movies where humans are suppressing animals, but it is. The entire movie is about the boss baby trying to stop puppies from becoming cuter for the benefit of babies, making it, in my opinion, quite the appropriate timepiece. And I think there are three pieces of definitive proof it exists in the same universe as the rest of these movies, all within a space of a five second clip. So it all comes in this moment where the boss baby is explaining the history of baby kind to the other babies. And so, as if they're a species? You're just gonna have to wrap your head around the boss baby, its existence. Do they stay babies? Is that the grown up baby? I, I'm, not, baby? I'm not explaining the plot of the boss baby to you. Anyway, so he's explaining the history of baby kind and he shows baby's existence as cave people. And I believe it's pretty obvious that those two cave people are none other than Eep and Guy. Yep, she has hair and he has hair. And okay, maybe, there's maybe. like a faint, uh, like, suggestion that there is a little uh, ponytail on top. Then in the next slide on his slideshow, it reveals that the Egyptians were around. I don't know who this Egyptian is or anything about that, but you know, the Egyptians, that, that we've got the Prince of Egypt, so therefore- so, uh, Egypt exists. Egypt exists. Okay. And my favorite one, and what I think you're gonna have to give me is the fact that Marie Antoinette is shown. And of course, Marie Antoinette is in Mr. Peabody and Sherman. And she just has like an active conversation with the two of them. She eats cake with them. So like personally, I think Marie Antoinette is just a character in this universe. So this is as good as Mr. Peabody and Sherman themselves showing up in The Boss Baby. And if you liked that, you're gonna love how we're gonna connect the bad guys because it connects in the exact same way at the start of the bad guys movie when they're introducing the characters mr shark is said to have stolen the mona lisa and mona lisa is like mentioned by name and you'll never guess what mona lisa is she's in the she's in mr peabody and sherman mona lisa has spoken lines a character we like meet leonardo da vinci painting her and in the bad guys mr shark steals that painting but she's right there and she's not wearing the same thing like that's not the same thing she's wearing I think you're, really, uh, you're, 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 you're nitpicking the Mr. Peabody and Sherman movie, not my Easter egg. Though. That's a different colour as well. She's wearing like a whole like a coat type thing. If you go on the IMDB page for Mr. Peabody and Sherman, the likes of Mona Lisa and Marie Antoinette come up as characters. So if you suspend your disbelief for a minute and just imagine they're fictional characters, oh, yeah. it's pretty significant that they get name dropped and then also like shown and mentioned in other movies. I actually think about the Mona Lisa a lot because like, it's like the painting in, in, in our world. And like, you know, like anytime the movie like references like a famous painting, it's the Mona Lisa. And like, who's gonna, like it's been around for like 300 years. When are they gonna have like the next big painting that kind of like takes over, you know? I'm trying to come up with a funny joke. And I guess... You can't, I've just made a really clever point, I think. So far, it, it, it's going really well, look at that. The bad guys is in. So next up, we're going to talk about Spirit. Have you ever seen The Sexy Spirit? Horse? Is that not the one? The Sexy it Horse? It is The Sexy Horse, yeah. yeah. Now, DreamWorks have made two movies in the little Spirit series, which I think both quite clearly take place during this colonization period in the timeline. And there aren't many other movies during this time period, making it probably the best example of the animal suppression that was going on at this time. But it's also very difficult to connect 
because there are no other movies going on at this time. However, that's what brings us to The Boss Baby 2 family business. In The Boss Baby 2 family business, there's like a scene where there's like a car chase going on and they like race through a cinema screen and Spirit, Stallion of the Cimarron, is playing on that cinema. So therefore, we have two choices. Either Spirit is a movie in universe and it's fictional, or it's a movie. Or, or, well, I don't think cameras would have existed back in these times. Okay. So it would be based like, maybe like that. based on a true story. If you wanted to interpret it as like, okay, this could have really happened as well, but we can't prove it's a, yeah. based on a true story. Now, obviously, you know, because we've done this before, if something's a movie in universe, we have a little yellow yarn, which is like, okay, it's fictional in universe. Whereas if it's real in universe, we just continue with the red yarn. I like it even if it is fictional because it still shows that there are some humans on this side of the animals and know that animals have been suppressed and want to fight for their rights. And, you know, maybe those humans didn't deserve to go extinct at the end. Well, you don't know if people support the movie. Someone made the movie. There's some like artist out there like, we're suppressing animals, we need to fight for their rights, and then made this movie. And there was no one in that cinema. There was no one, yeah, the cinema is actually empty. You might be right. That's kind of canon to the universe. Most yeah. people don't support the, the animals. They want the suppression of animals, except for the person who made the movie. So now we've reached DreamWorks' largest franchise by some way. So there's about six movies in it. I believe this is probably the most interesting point in the timeline, and I believe it's happening in like those medieval times, kind of like before the 12th century in North America. The difference between it and our real world is that magic and fairy tales are ubiquitous in society at this point. That was a good word. Also, in the Shrek universe, animals are shown to not only be intelligent, but able to communicate with humans and are now pretty much just living in harmony with them to an extent. Humans are still very clearly the dominant species though, and we can specifically see this in the first movie through Lord Farquaad's discriminations and prejudices towards animals and more specifically magical creatures in society, which ultimately I think are the first examples in this universe of the downfall and general suppression of animals. Also with Shrek, once again, we have a franchise very happy to mess around with alternate realities, time travel storylines, and just parallel dimensions in general, which is great because similarly to Mr. Peabody and Sherman, the main connection actually comes through Dawn of the Crew. Shrek and Donkey also <laughs> appear as a drawing on a cave. Those are works. Which implies maybe they were drawn by real cave people. Th there are various ways we could explain this, I think. Firstly, we've already shown that Mr. Peabody and Sherman went back to that time. It's very plausible that Mr. Peabody and Sherman also went back to Shrek's time period and decided to draw Shrek and Donkey on those walls. I also think it's just possible that there's a magic potion that sends someone back in time for five minutes in the Shrek universe because there's magic potions for everything. Time travel is established. There is time travel in the movie Shrek Forever After, kind of. He reverses the history of the universe, but it does like completely change the timeline of the universe. Off-screen plotline where they just accidentally popped back in time for two minutes and then Someone drew them in that time and then that's, that's, that's how they connect. Do you need this connection? Anyway, if you're not convinced, there's a scene in The Boss Baby where a Humpty Dumpty toy is seen on their nightstand. In the Shrek universe, Humpty Dumpty is like a real living egg. Mm -hmm. <laughs> now, my argument with this is that fairy tale characters existed in universe, so they're like actual historical figures rather than fairy tale characters. Like the Mona Lisa. Like the Mona Lisa. They're like Moses. You know, Humpty Dumpty's a bit like Moses. <laughs> Sorry, I said I wouldn't bring that up again. And therefore, maybe this Humpty Dumpty toy is based off the real egg being that existed. So if we're technically arguing that all these fairy tale characters are historical figures, it does lead to one major question that I'm sure you're wondering. What happened to them? Because obviously I suggested that they existed in North America and then the Europeans got there, colonized North America. Maybe it's implied they got killed. But I actually think there's a better explanation out there. Which brings us to Troll Hunters Rise of the Titans. What the fuck is this movie? <laughs> I thought you might ask that. But I wrote in my script, Vegard will say, what is this? He then said, what the fuck is this movie? And then I had a line saying, and you will chuckle and quickly say, I thought you might ask that. I don't script these videos that much, but I just knew you weren't going to know what that Could was. Could you imagine if I was just like, oh yeah, I have watched this. So, Troll Hunters Rise of the Titans is technically on the Wikipedia list I showed earlier, just in the direct -to video slash streaming section with Joseph. And since I included Joseph, I felt like I should include it too. Basically, it's a DreamWorks movie that's made by DreamWorks television animation. And like, it still has the DreamWorks logo at the start. So as far as I'm aware, that counts as a DreamWorks movie. But basically, there are three TV shows made by Guillermo del Toro, Troll Hunters, Free Below, 
and wizards. And as a whole, they are the tales of Arcadia. And they culminate in this movie finale called Troll Hunters, The Rise of the Titans. Now, I've not seen any of these shows, but I did watch the movie with absolutely no context. And the best thing I can do to recap it is just kind of tell you what they say at the start of the movie where they attempt to recap the entire three shows in a three minute opening sequence. Essentially a long time ago, in the medieval era, there was a war between humankind and magic. Like, like Shrek. It's like Shrek, that's again what it says in the script. And then jump forward to the present day, which is where Troll Hunters takes place. Trolls have now moved to live underground, away from human society. And and I guess there's like some amulet that picks this human guy to like be the troll savior, but the troll hunter, but the, the, uh, there are some evil trolls, there are some good trolls. So he's got to like kill the evil ones, save the good ones, I think, something like that. And then the second TV show, you've got some aliens that come and help them fight the trolls. And then finally, you have the one where they team up with wizards and go all the way back in time to the days of Camelot. And that includes none other than Merlin. Why does he look like that? Why is he wearing like a modern bow suit? They're at war in this time, okay. so like I think it's like his armor. And Merlin, of course, then appears in Shrek the Third. Looks a bit different here. Now, I thought you might say this, but Merlin is established to be a immortal wizard in this universe. So I don't think changing his appearance is really an issue that much. And also another character that shows up is King Arthur, who is actually crowned at the end of Shrek the Third. Now, obviously the argument is, do they look the same? I actually think he could grow up to be him. Like he's got a beard now and he's been going gym quite a bit, I'd say. Yeah. It also magic exists. Yeah. He could have like, you know, like the fairy godmothers like make yourself the best version of yourself potion. What's called the happy ever after potion. Bigger nose, bigger eyes. <laughs> so it's like literally canon in Shrek the Third that King Arthur gets made the king yeah of far, far away. And then we meet King Arthur as the king as this magic war is happening in the TV show that finishes in that movie. Obviously also beyond the whole, do they look similar issues that Vegard raised. I also think there is the minor issue that far, far away and Camelot are different places. So how can King Arthur be king of far, far away and Camelot? But I'm going to argue that since there's quite a bit of time between these two things, either King Arthur invaded Camelot and just expanded his kingdom or rebranded far far away to Camelot <laughs> he re as a king. And with this being canon as Vegard has now kindly pinned it It really helps tie up some things with this theory firstly It helps explain what happens to magical beings like for example trolls are still alive just hiding underground during wizards Merlin actually levitated Camelot from the ground so that people wouldn't be able to find it so technically Far, far away could still exist. In all of the universe, it's just floating somewhere. And it also gives us another alien invasion, which uh, there are gonna be a few more of. Anyway, I'm not planning on getting into the alien movies right now because that's gonna be a lot. So let's just have a breather, get back into this animal-human war going on and talk about Madagascar. So Madagascar is one of the most obvious examples of animals rising up against humans in these modern era movies. I mean, it's literally a movie about a bunch of zoo animals tired of being looked down upon breaking out of their zoo and moving to Madagascar. <laughs> it further backs up the fact they're able to communicate amongst each other. And in this one, they're not able to communicate with people. Ah, oh, Nick's lost again. But as shown in the B movie, I think they were choosing not to communicate with people. Cause like, there's like the big moment of Barry speaking for the first time in the B movie. And I think, cause we haven't reached that point in the timeline yet, animals, either yet, they haven't like learnt to communicate with humans yet, or they've unlearnt how to do it from when they could in the past. And I also think in the Madagascar movies, we get the first signs of the animals getting ready to sort of fight back. And then specifically in Madagascar 3, we get the first signs of humans kind of catching on to the animal's rise of intelligence. Anyway, though, there aren't any connections in the movies, and we have to turn to all hail King Julian for our Easter egg. I've got to admit, this is kind of random, but Puss in Boots just shows up in there for like two seconds in like a not even very funny bit. Now you're most likely thinking, well, doesn't Shrek take place centuries before the Madagascar movies? Cause Madagascar is obviously in the modern day. Isn't um, Madagascar uh, way in the future and it's centuries after? Yes. How could Puss in Boots be here. While he did actively fight against death himself in The Last Wish, I do think the whole point of the movie is that he accepted 
that one day he will have to die and that he isn't immortal. Are you gonna bring up time travel again? You'll be in for a treat because this show is just certifiably insane. Can I just like take you through some things that happen in All Hail yeah, King Julian? There is the reveal of a multiverse where multiple variants of characters exist. So that that's established. One of these universes includes an entire army of destructive morts that everyone in that universe is just him. There's an intelligence serum that exists that can basically make someone an, an omniscient being. And we also get to meet these higher life forms in the shape of a talking pineapple and melon that's in a wheelchair for some reason. And they explain the rules of the multiverse and how all that works just by breaking the fourth wall. It's very weird. And that is all just in one episode. I, I, I didn't feel the need to watch any more episodes of the show. So there's another universe where he chose to be immortal and he's there. I like your idea. A different universe, Puss in Boots, he chose, chose immortality at the end of The Last Wish. And we saw a multiversal version of that Puss in Boots who somehow traveled to this universe for some reason. Yeah. Long story short, we're dealing with two series that aren't afraid to deal with alternate dimensions, parallel universes and whatnot. So I think Puss in Boots showing up in All Hail King Julian for two seconds is the least of our worries. Also, I just want to say the YouTuber The Theorizer has a like 100 episode series. It's not 100 episodes, it's like 20 episode series all about Mort and what this means. And I'm not even going to attempt to try and go into it in any more detail than I just have. But if you do want to watch that, you can. Next up, we got Turbo. Once again, this is a movie during the present day showing that animals are more talented than humans are giving them credit for. Have I mentioned that animals are more powerful than humans realize in the modern day movies yet? And it's one of the first movies where humans actually start to really respect animals because they're, oh wow, we didn't know you could do that. But it's also just really dumb, starring Ryan Reynolds. In Turbo, we see this That's newspaper the from Madagascar. That's the monkeys from Madagascar that are shown in this newspaper article on Tito's wall. Are they in and, the same timeline? Uh, I actually think, yeah, I think because Turbo's modern day, Madagascar's modern day, I actually think that fits up quite nicely. Not much more needs to be said. Now we've got to the point where aliens are here. Now, I feel like I was kind of transparent earlier that I feel like the whole kind of aliens invading Earth while humans are fighting animals part is a bit out of place. Like for the most part, it kind of comes out of nowhere and doesn't really fit up with the rest of the story. But it does just keep happening. And Monsters vs. Aliens is by far the easiest one to connect. For one, General Monge's Medal of Order has Shrek on it. I, I kind of agree with your look there. It could just be any ogre. I also don't really know what that's for. Like, d does that really? prove anything? There's another one that he just has like a skull on his. I actually think the better links for Monsters vs. Aliens are actually its links to Madagascar. During this scene of Galaxar taking over the world, specifically the one in Japan, we can see in this little corner, Marty and Alex. Yeah. Are they conferencing in? Are they doing an ad? Perfume so I will admit, I think this is a pretty difficult one to explain the logic behind. I'm not 100% sure what two Wait. zoo animals from New York are doing on a billboard in Japan. But also, it is Japan. And Japan kind of does weird stuff like that. They could have like a sitcom out there as far as I'm aware. However, there's more. In the short film, Night of the Living Carrots, Bob is shown with a Alex plush from yeah. Madagascar. No, but these are, this is what I'm saying, they're doing an ad, they're a franchise. Alex and Marty are so well known that they do an ad where they can talk as well. I guess that's now established. Yeah. And this isn't just any toy, this is actually canon merchandise in the Madagascar universe that is seen various times over multiple forms of Madagascar media. Yeah. They're already franchise, yeah, they're already popular. He's like a famous toy. Yeah. Well, fam no, he's a famous lion yeah. and he has merchandise and toys about him. Either way, that's a few connections for yeah. Monsters vs. Aliens to Madagascar. That guy's just giving me everything today. And as you'll remember from- This is the one you fucked up cutting. Can you tell I wasn't here when these were being cut out? I don't know if you can even tell. Oh yeah, you can. You can even see us. Seamus was on Arts and Crafts you seen today. <laughs> it's because it's all white, so I didn't know where the border started, and I think that's why. Also, we have scissors that are about the length of this, so how you went up this much. This I don't want to talk about it. As you remember from the timeline I went through, the B-movie is actually pivotal to the rise in animal rights in this universe, as it's the first time we see animals openly communicating with humans in the modern era, and also the first time animals win rights in universe. All because they decided to make a movie where a woman left her husband because she fell in love with a bee. And the movie actually ends with Barry setting up a law firm to help animals fight their rights and actually take humans to court. And one of his clients shown at the end is this cow. And she also appears in Monsters vs. Aliens. 
Zend I'll admit it's a pretty blurry shot, but come on, there's resemblance there. Let's see, this is getting into that territory with animals where they're like the plushie is like an exact same thing and it looks exactly the same. This is a cow. I understand this may not be the most compelling piece of evidence. Okay. Yeah. But let's not make any rash decisions right now. Let's just keep it there for, for a minute. Do you remember the, the bear from over the head? Yeah. That bear yeah. appears in, in the B-movie. That one's more similar. And this bear does get thrown in jail, right? Does he get killed? I don't think so. Does Vincent die in Over the Hedge? No. No. He's alive. Maybe the laser made him look lighter in colour when the hair grew back. Yeah, yeah. And he was a prisoner in the B movie because he's like all chained up and stuff when used as a witness. Again, don't make any rash decisions yet. Maybe just like put these to the side. We don't, we, uh, we're not saying this is over yet, okay? Do you remember in Over the Hedge, this uh, like Chris Brand buddies? Buddy. They're quite prominent. Yeah. It's in the first scene where RJ they meets Vincent. It. They talk about it. It like, actually plays into a lot of the plot points in the movie. Well, Spuddies <laughs> also shows up in Home. What's Home? the alien movie with Rihanna. <laughs> and therefore, technically that would connect to Over the Hedge, which connects to the B movie. Cause like, also this cow wants to take humans to court and it's clearly being treated awfully by humans. But if you really don't want it, we can maybe connect it through How to Train Your Dragon. Now, How to Train Your Dragon is definitely in this medieval period. It specifically takes place when the Vikings were around. Obviously you know all about the Vikings. Oh, yeah. And again, it's one of the first movies chronologically that shows humans suppressing animals' intelligence. Specifically, mostly through fear. The Vikings fear the dragons, so therefore want to kill them. I've concluded it's most likely that these movies happened at the same time as the Shrek and like this whole stuff in Troll Hunters, just, you know, in Europe. Which one helps explain why How to Train Your Dragons franchise and Shrek's franchise don't really overlap, and also potentially gives a backstory to the dragon from Shrek. Did she flee? I theorised that she fled the dragon territory, which is somewhere in Scandinavia, and arrived in America where she was immediately taken captive. And while I know I specifically said at the start of the video this doesn't count, and I want to clear up, I'm not using this as evidence, in the How to Train Your Dragon game, Dragon's Rise of Burke, Dragon from Shrek and her dronkies appear. As I said, I don't think that counts as evidence, but I just like that as an idea that the dragon came from Europe to North yeah. America. The better Easter egg, in my opinion, comes in the prequel short to home, Almost Home, which is a short film made about the aliens looking for a planet before they found Earth that actually came out before Home itself. And it includes this scene of them landing on a planet and a dragon picking up with its talons one of the little aliens and taking it away. Now, I can't claim to know much about the How to Train Your Dragon dragons and what they look like, what their names are. I have not read a single bit of information on this, but if I'm going to take the word of people who know a lot more about this than me online, they claim that this is a type of dragon called a deadly nadder. And you're probably thinking, okay, but wouldn't that imply that then How to Train Your Dragon's taking place on a whole separate planet? Yeah. So therefore wouldn't even... However, I want to argue that. What if the aliens just visited Earth twice over the space of a thousand years? And you're like, okay, but how do we know the aliens were looking for a thousand years? It doesn't seem like they've been looking for a thousand years. That's where I bring up a phenomenon called gravitational time dilation, which basically means... <laughs> Which basically means that they could have only been searching for 10 years in their time, um, but were moving at such a fast speed that a thousand years passed on Earth while they were doing that. So they visited Earth a thousand years ago, went looking for about 10 more years, and then came back to Earth after a thousand years when they did eventually inhabit Earth because yeah. the dragons were gone by that stage. Well, if you want to give that as a connection to home, it's fun at the very least, then we can connect it to the main universe on the basis that the sheep from How to Train Your Dragon one of them appears in Penguins of Madagascar. <laughs> oh, yeah. Again, timeline issues, a, a little problematic here because Penguins of Madagascar is I mean, but... thousands of years in the future, but we all know what happens in All Hail King Julian. And that's in the same universe as Penguins of Madagascar. So I've just given you a lot of information to think about there. We've got B-Movie connecting to Monsters vs. Aliens through a cow. B-Movie then connects to Over the Hedge through Vincent. Over the Hedge connects to Home through Spuddies. And then the sheep 
from Madagascar connects to how, how to train your dragon? The cow is the worst one, I think, but I'm not saying no. Going purely based on this made-up story that this cow has been treated poorly, which... I think if there was a cow to go to court, it would, it would be, be the cow that got abducted. Yeah, so maybe that's like a subsection of the lawsuit. So we're getting it. This is all connecting. It's all connecting! They are going to connect to the B movie. Oh, here we go. He's got the string in place. Now he's gonna go reach down for the pin. Yes, he's got the pin in hand. The pin is connected. Oh, it's a perfect connection. I've got to say, this is elegant work right now. And yes, grab that board for stability. That is good work and it is done. Which means next up, we've got over the hedge. Is Vegar gonna keep up this run of perfect pinning precision? Oh, that was good alliteration from me. Sorry, we're talking about Vegar. Oh, look at this work. Oh, he's got it already. I missed it. Uh, well, I guess, yeah, over the hedge is into. I thought I was going to have to argue that sheep showing up in penguins in Madagascar way more because technically it could just be any sheep. But it's the same looking, like when you yeah. showed me video, like clips of other animals, it's been like a completely different drawing style mm. and it's just been a species of animal. But These least... ones are like the same animal. I was going to go into detail. I have a whole bit written about how this sheep maybe got stuck into some weird time travel storyline because it was hanging out with the penguins in Madagascar, which meant it ended up in the How to Train Your Dragon era. But if you're happy to give it, it's just because, oh, that's what sheep look like, then I'll take it. Remember not to cover up too much of the what the board chose. He's already got a hat trick. Is he going to go for four? It looks like he is. Oh my god, how to train your dragon is connecting to the universe too. I have never seen a better performance than this in my life. What are we talking about next? We're, we're, we're talking about Shark Tale. Oh, I wonder what Shark Tale tells us about the universe. Do you think it reveals that animals are actually smarter than humans realize and have their own little society built? So Oscar from Shark Tale actually appears once again in Dawn of the Croods. So he makes a little cameo in the episode Creature from a Crude Lagoon. And well, he's seen it, you know, in the lagoon. Yeah, but is that a type of fish that exists? I don't know, I think like that's a pretty specifically designed character. Yeah. I'm gonna say that fish doesn't exist. Oh my god, it doesn't exist. That's so cool, it's him. The problem the fish experts are gonna be in the comments. <laughs> Actually, that fish is a blah, 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 blah. For Shark Tale to connect, fish society has to have been technologically advanced for thousands of years. And the only thing I can use to like help this pass the logic test is that there is no other movie or instance where we see fish societies. Well, thousands of years ago. Yeah, they eat fish, but like, we never see like any fish society. And also time travel exists. Time travel does exist, but I don't know who's going to have time traveled and just thrown Oh, well, yeah. used to say they didn't come up with their own time travel if they're so smart. How technologically? Yeah. They're kind of just a human society underwater. Like, they have TVs and stuff underwater, which has always been a bit confusing to me, because so... are they waterproof TVs? How are they generating electricity? No, see, they're further along. They've invented time travel. Either way, we don't really meet any humans in this movie. It's not like Finding Nemo, where like you see deep sea divers and stuff, and you can see like where human societies are. The only problem is, and... Honestly, I'm surprised you didn't bring this up because you love this movie so much. The whole story of Shark Tale revolves around a shark getting hit by an anchor and then Oscar claiming he managed to slay the shark. So he becomes like the shark slayer. Either way, Oscar is in Dawn of the Croods. Um, you can give it or not, you're going to make the thread actually thinner. Yeah. Because <laughs> I was like, okay, yeah, it can't be as far back as the Croods if there's an anchor because surely boats and therefore anchors don't exist during the crude time. But don't they but, have like weird where they have like a, a phone but it's not a phone? Yeah, they have like, it's like very Flintstones. -y. Yeah. Who do you think humans were inspired by to create technology? Shark fish. fish. You ready to talk about trolls? So trolls, specifically with the inclusion of troll hunters, gets a little bit confusing because in the trolls universe, yeah, it's upside down. Um, it just, just turn that the right way up. Like, it just, you know, you know, you're getting there, you're just like 180. No, the other way. Because in the Trolls universe, trolls are these kind of like small, colorful, annoying creatures. They're troll dolls. Yeah, they're, I know they're, I know, I know they're troll dolls, but in this they're not dolls, they're... Troll dolls. Yes, I know what troll dolls are, they're in Toy Story. In Trolls... Did you get them at the dentist? No! The because I always picked them, that was always my favorite thing. So in this universe, <laughs> trolls, are these things and the creatures that are closer to what the human perception of real trolls are are the Bergens but like technically all that's really wrong there is the name you know 
Like beyond the naming issue, we kind of do have real trolls in this trolls universe, which would technically make it fit up with the likes of troll hunters. But either way, I think this takes place all the way back then. Is it in far, far away? No, but it's going on somewhere, you know? Maybe it's like in a, like an obscure island that no one else is because they don't seem to know about humans' existence yet. And the only real connections that exist in universe for it are in the present day where people have troll dolls. So there's a troll in The Boss Baby. This looks like a shot from Toy Story. Right? And then you also have another troll toy just from a different angle that looks like... Isn't she a pet? And those would imply that people have some knowledge of trolls' existence. Yeah, I know it's not very much, but there is one final connection which is also just dumb, but I think it's kind of funny. In Fiona's room in Shrek 2, okay. she has a poster of Sir Justin, which is a reference to Justin, Justin Timberlake, Timberlake, who plays... The no. It's the sad moment where I'm starting to realize not all the DreamWorks movies are going to connect in the same universe. Sorry about it, Trolls is the first one. <laughs> yeah. For now, at least. We haven't got to Rise of the Guardians yet. Rise of the Guardians could change everything. So we have Matty Healy. <laughs> yeah, Matty Healy the movie. This is Matty Healy the movie. There's only one thing I remember from Flushed Away, and that's the fact one of the characters' middle name is Leslie. Because he goes, Danger's my middle name, and then someone goes, I thought it was Leslie. Danger is my middle name. I thought it was Leslie. Oh. You should be really embarrassed about that name and confess it under the starry sky after giving a star as a present to his girlfriend. <sighs> and then she can confess that she has a secret life as a pop, world-renowned pop star, which no one knows about because she wants the best of both worlds. So Flushed Away may just seem like another pretty on-the-nose example of animals being intelligent unbeknownst to humans and pretty easy to fit in because the Alex from Madagascar toy shows up in Roddy St. Jr.'s room. The problem is that this movie has what I'm coining the Ralph Breaks the Internet issue, where it's just revealed that pretty much every DreamWorks movie in their catalogue up until the point of this movie coming out is a DVD on display. Basically, for this to be canon in-universe, all of the other stuff on the board would have to be a DVD. I don't think I have the energy to even try and explain that. Yeah. No, let's just pin it with the yellow. But it's not yellow because they're all movies to it, not the other way around. So let's make up a new rule for the blue, that that's what that is. Well, I mean, yeah, this just, Vegard just said that we should make this the movie outside of the universe where these movies all exist in this universe as movies. And that's what the blue yarn stands for. Take of that what you want, Will. Which brings us nicely to Wallace and Gromit, which I'm going to say is a weird one because, you know, it already kind of has its own universe where all these movies exist. I guess you could say it fits in with the rest of the present day era movies because Gromit is clearly more than just your average dog. And I guess that makes Wallace like an animal rights activist in universe because he isn't suppressing Gromit despite his intelligence. But also this movie doesn't bring anything new to the table. And its only connection is that at the start of Fushed Away when you can see the Alex toy you can also see a Gromit toy yeah. in her room and also I guess the DVD case we're saying flushed away is canon so therefore everything that shows up on the board in flushed away should count then right well it counts but it's not connected anyway let's go back to the beginning DreamWorks is first movie ants it's um, Hannah Montana in the multiverse. Do they ever discuss Miley Cyrus? What are you talking about? What, what, like, what, are you, what are you actually talking about? Back to DreamWorks' first movie. Here it's revealed that ants and insects alike, unlike most animals in the present day, have a pretty developed society. I guess you could say similarly to fish. I'm thinking like with the fish, humans didn't suppress them because they were underwater and they didn't really see it. Yeah. And with the ants and insects, they're just so small. Humans kind of they aren't bothered by them, I guess. Do people not show up in ants? Yeah, they do. And when they do, they try and kill the ants. So okay. ants just kind of keep out their way. However, in terms of Easter eggs, being the first DreamWorks movie, it, it's pretty difficult for it to have Easter eggs for other DreamWorks movies because there were no other DreamWorks movies when it came out. The only thing I can find is weirdly in Shrek, where if you zoom in a lot and squint your eyes, you can see a picture of Z inside the window at the Julok Castle. Oh, why is he there? <laughs> oh, that's such a jump scare. Why is he there? I don't know. And why is he huge? But ultimately, this doesn't make any sense because ants takes place in Central Park in the modern day, and Shrek was like a thousand years ago. So I'm going to unsquint my eyes and uh, not see that, and therefore Ants does not connect. I'm making that decision myself. And sadly, from here, the Easter eggs are starting to get It gets really worse. Scared. Firstly, we've got Sinbad, Legend of the Seven Seas, which I believe would most likely take place a few thousand years ago at the start of phase two, the bronze or 
Iron Age, I can't remember what it was called. And I can't find any Easter eggs or cameos in this movie, nor can I find any Easter eggs or cameos referencing this movie from another DreamWorks movie. So I guess just like the last three also has to go in the corner of death, it's getting sad. Then we have Chicken Run, which is again, Literally another movie about animals rising up against their human overlords. Or I guess specifically in this case, running up against their human overlords. You get this chicken run. They're really about flying. Unfortunately though, there are no Easter eggs in this movie or any other movie referencing this movie. However, Chicken Run 2 is coming out later this year. So maybe it will connect later this year, but right now, Without Chicken Run 2 being canon, it, we, we can't connect it. It's weird, because it would have been so easy to have like a plushie of that guy, because he's like a famous... Yeah, I literally have a plushie of that back in my parents' house. When you like Google it and stuff and like look up Easter eggs, people claim there are Easter eggs for this movie. Apparently there's a scene in Madagascar that has ginger in a picture, but I can't find them. So don't think I say this half-heartedly. There are no Easter eggs in Chicken Run. Then we have Megamind. This is the last, or I guess, potentially the first chronologically of the alien invasion movies. I can't actually claim to know what the order of these invasions are, but I'm assuming this is the first one. Now, the best theory with this is that Galaxar from Monsters vs. Aliens kind of looks like Megamind, and maybe they're the same species. I just think it's generic alien though, isn't it? Big head. Yeah. And also, they have different numbers of eyes. So yeah, the theory goes that Galaxar has actually been looking around the universe to find Megamind, because he wants to kill him, I guess. But then the obvious contradiction is that Galaxar openly says the reason why he's invading Earth is because he wants to find a meteorite with Quantonian in it. Unless Megamind is another word for Quantonium and meteorite is another word for pod that Megamind entered Earth on, I don't think that's Maybe. the case. And outside of that, there are no Easter eggs or anything connecting this to the wider universe, unfortunately. It's just another alien movie and I guess superhero movie as well, which actually, Talking about superhero movies, we've also got Captain Underpants, the first epic movie. Again, this is just another movie happening during the present day where humans are just kind of getting on with their own thing, unbeknownst to them, animals are about to rise up. And also superheroes are in this. There's nothing to say. So what, superpowers? Oh yeah, we've already seen superpowers in Turbo and Megamind. It's not even that exciting at this stage. And then there's Abominable. Nothing. There's no Easter eggs in any of these. And with that, we finally reached the final series and franchise in the timeline. Kung Fu Panda. So, okay, I'm gonna argue, I'm gonna try and argue this now. You'd think logistically, since Kung Fu Panda is the last thing in the timeline and is following the animal and human war that inevitably must have happened after the bad guys and everything else, it actually makes more sense for there not to be any Easter eggs in this because all the characters in all of these movies up until this point are dead. Famously dead things just disappear from existence. But I even think there's some evidence of like remnants of human existence in the Kung Fu Panda universe, despite the fact it's being habited by animals. Animals in this movie walk on hind legs, something that they don't typically do in other movies, especially when they're less developed. I found like typically across these movies, the more developed the animal is, the more likely they are to walk on hind legs. Like Mr. Peabody walks on hind legs. The bad guys being developed animals walk on hind legs but then like if you go back to like i don't know the prince of egypt the animals aren't walking on hind legs and that's like a sign they've like copied the human moving style secondly the world that these animals are living in is a world that was built by humans it's the exact world we see in these movies you know like they're in china which we actually see in abominable i know it doesn't connect but so that um, doesn't matter but like but like they're living in the human world yeah. as animals. It's not like Zootopia, where they all like have built their own animal society. They are living in a human world as animals. How do you know? They're living in human-made houses, learning how to make human-designed food, like noodles and stuff, like things we created as humans, doing human activities like kung fu. These are all things that humans invented, that animals are partaking in, in this universe and in this movie. And I don't think I'm selling you at all. So if you want to just put it in the corner, you can put it in the corner. Yeah. But I really think that there's some decent evidence in favor of Kung Fu Panda just being like a really, really far in the future movie. Which brings us to what I would consider the most important movie in this entire universe that's going to bring back all of these movies that were thrown in the corner of death back to life. I'm talking about 
Rise of the Guardians. There's actually some great Easter eggs in Rise of the Guardians. Easter eggs. Some great Easter eggs. So while the main bulk of Rise of the Guardians takes place during the modern day, there are moments in this movie in the past, specifically in the colonization era, where Jack Frost was first chosen to become a Guardian. So I'm going to go through the lore of what the Guardians are now quickly. It's pretty clearly established that the Guardians were chosen quite some time ago to be this group of almost godlike beings with the shared goal of protecting the children of the planet. And the Guardians obviously include Santa, the Tooth Fairy, the Sandman, the Easter Bunny, and last but not least, Jack Frost. It's worth noting as well that not all the Guardians are humans. You have a bunny, you have a fairy, you even have these like walking eggs, which I guess are established being in the Shrek universe. So there was never any intentions from the powers that be to create this divide and war between humans and animals and magic kind. But ultimately the Guardians couldn't intervene and prevent the tragedies that became of this world. And you know what? I think I can connect this movie to the rest through one thing. You may have noticed I said that one of the Guardians is Santa Claus, or as he likes to go by, Nicholas St. North. And this Guardian also appears in the Shrek Christmas special, Shrek the Halls, and appears in the Madagascar Christmas special, Merry Madagascar. This is a canon character from the Guardians universe that appears in both Shrek and Madagascar. He looks different. Okay, but like, you know, he can change up his style. To be fair, he is magic. So Santa Claus makes it canon in a very thin thread. Which brings me to my final point, which I think brings the whole universe together. The Guardians, if I'm going to quote myself from about a minute ago, are almost godlike beings in this universe. And being these godlike beings are aware of this higher power. The one who chose them to become the Guardians, none other than what they refer to as You were chosen like we were all chosen by men and moon. The DreamWorks logo isn't just a logo that comes before the movie. The boy on the moon is literally God in universe. This is canon. You, you have attached it. So this is officially canon that this DreamWorks logo boy is literally God. They could be talking about any boy on the moon. No, they're talking about the boy on the moon. And before every movie, it's not the logo we're seeing. It's the boy on the moon or God reeling in a new story in his universe to show us. Beautiful. First name DreamWorks, last name a Comcast company. I'm just gonna call him God. He's also the God that the Prince of Egypt talks to. And while you may think, oh, but this is the only movie that has evidence for this. Well, there's one other movie that also has evidence for the boy on the moon God. In the road, to El Dorado, a movie that I believe takes place during the colonization period. You know, spirit is there to show the animals getting suppressed. This movie's more there to show like magic being suppressed, but both firmly in the colonization era of the timeline, we see this ancient text that reveals the boy <laughs> on the moon. It looks wildly different to this boy on the moon. Yeah, but it's an ancient text. And they refer to the boy on the moon as like God in Rise of the Guardians. And then the road to El Dorado has the boy on the moon in an ancient text, which is like in South America. And it's like the God that they believe in in South America, all those thousands of years ago is the same god that they reference in Rise of the Guardians all those years into the future, connecting the whole universe through the boy in the moon being god. I have a question. Yeah. Okay, in is? spirit. Yeah. There is also this logo. Yeah. That is an in-universe movie and it's the same shot as this. How do you explain that? Well, DreamWorks is also a company in universe because it's just like a religion, I guess. So it'd be like equivalent of like a movie company opening with a cross, a crucifix. And then saying a God production. <laughs> a God production. <laughs> so this is all just religious movies. These are the movies the moon God has reeled in to show us the stories from his universe. Oh. I think you should connect the road of, to El Dorado to the Rise of the Guardians due to the fact they have the same God. Maybe Roddy St. James. Maybe the boy on the moon is Matty Healy. And there we have it the DreamWorks cinematic universe from a canon perspective. All in all, I'm not gonna lie, I actually really love this as a theory. I didn't think it was gonna work nearly as well as it did. Like, I suggested doing this at the end of my Disney cinematic universe video, and I thought there's no way I'm gonna be able to connect movies like Shrek and How to Train Your Dragon and Kung Fu Panda all in the same universe. And then like, as I was reading more stuff and like digging into myself, I was like, oh my God, I didn't realize how many of these movies are all about like animals rising up. And therefore you can then make this timeline of like, oh my God, the animals rise up and then we just end up in this world where there are no humans and just animals. I, like, I'm genuinely shocked that 
This isn't a hugely popular theory that someone has made that kind of is on a level with the Pixar theory. I know with the Pixar theory, there are more Easter eggs and cameos across the movies. So like when we did the Pixar theory one, there weren't as many movies that don't get in as the about eight movies that Vegard wouldn't give me today. And Vegard was being very nice. And Jamie, I I'm really like love it. And I think the fact it connects and like you've got like the whole thing about the boy on the moon being God and that connecting to Rise of the Guardians and then kind of like making everything connect in that way. I mean, even though I couldn't prove all of them, I don't think it really means anything. Kung Fu Panda 4 is still coming out, so that could then connect to some of the movies. We've got Chicken Run 2 coming out. There could be loads of sequels to all of these movies in the corner to still make them all connect in some way in the future. And just because we can't prove it doesn't mean it didn't work. And at the end of the day, it's still a theory. If I could prove it all exists in the same universe, it wouldn't be a theory. It would just be, oh yeah, DreamWorks has a cinematic universe, by the way, and none of you guys realize. This is the DreamWorks cinematic universe theory. If you want to check out me doing these videos before with both Disney and Pixar, you can check them both out here. You can make sure to leave a like, subscribe, and I'll see you guys next time. We did it. <laughs> yeah.